We test products to learn about their quality. Every test is an experiment that can teach us new things about the product. We run these experiments on behalf of stakeholders, people who need to understand what we find out. Now we can't completely test the product. There are too many tests. So we have to focus our work around our information objectives. What I mean by an information objective is an answer to a question, what kind of information are we most concerned about learning from this testing? For example, on one project, we might focus on finding as many bugs as possible. I call that bug hunting. On a different project, or a different time in the same project, we might be less concerned with bug hunting, and more concerned about how well the project matches the specification, or how safe it is. We would run different tests, focus our work in different ways, to optimize getting these different types of information. I've now presented a few different definitions. Quality, testing, bugs. You've probably noticed that people don't always agree on what the same word means. The underlying problem is that there are different views about what makes for good testing. Look, people who start from strongly different theoretical positions are going to use language differently. That's how it is. I can't change that fact in this course, and I'm not going to pretend that we have one true definitions of the technical language of testing. We don't. We have a lot of controversy in a developing field. We need to accept that and work with it. The Association for Software Testing has started working on this with a dictionary project, which we host at Florida Tech. Real dictionaries often list several definitions for the same word. They don't pretend there's just one definition. The really good dictionaries, like Oxford English Dictionary or Black's Law Dictionary, list several definitions and give you examples of how each word was used, with references to authoritative sources who used it that way. That's what the Software Testing Dictionary is up to. If you're curious, come look up our terms in it. If you're an AST member, you can add definitions or add comments to the database. I use a lot of technical terms in this course. We need to define them. If I don't give you set meanings for them, you won't understand me. So I provide you with working definitions. This is what this word means in this course. That doesn't make the working definitions the right definitions. It does make them the definitions you need to know for tests and exams in this course. This course is about black box testing at the system level. So let's look at what that means. Let me start with the notion of black boxes. Historically, before computers and software ever existed, people talked about studying devices as black boxes. The notion of a black box is the notion of a closed thing. You can't look inside it to see how it works. Instead, you give it inputs, like pressing its buttons, and you watch what happens. When we do black box testing, we don't know we don't learn how the program was coded. We just know what it does. What we learn from black box testing is whether the program does what it should do and avoids doing what it shouldn't do. To understand what the program should do, we have to study the needs and expectations of the people who use it and the characteristics of the systems that will interact with it and the regulations that will govern it. The contrast with black box testing is glass box testing. We can see into the box. So we design our test based on the characteristics of the code. Many people call it glass box testing, white box instead. Then there's gray box testing, or if you prefer, translucent box testing. And the basic idea is that there are tests that aren't exactly black box, and they aren't exactly glass box, so we'll call them gray. For example, maybe you're going to study the values of variables that aren't visible to the end user, but you can see them using tools. I mean, it's a good test. But the term itself is so broad that I'm not sure the term is useful. On the other hand, it shows up in a lot of blogs, so you should have some familiarity with the term. Black box and glass box describe general approaches to testing. I don't know why some people call them techniques, but you'll see this quite often. A technique is a way of doing something. When we teach someone a technique, we teach them how to do a task. We'll look at a few techniques in the next lecture. But black box and glass box they're ways of looking at the world. They're not techniques. Another general approach to testing is called behavioral testing. Behavioral testers test the visible behavior of the program, but they often look inside the code to gain information to guide their tests. So behavioral testing is kind of like black box testing, except that it misses the point of black box testing. If you want to use system level testing to discover whether the program behaves as you would expect from the code, use behavioral testing. As a programmer, I did a lot of behavioral testing. I wanted to see how my code actually performed. Now, I called what I was doing glass box testing, but whatever we call it, it doesn't matter. It's certainly useful and important to do. But when I tested other people's code, I was doing something different. 
My questions were less about the internal implementation and more about the value of the running program. Yeah, sure, coding errors detract from value. I wanted to find them. But to prepare for this testing, I had to learn who would use this program and why. What devices or platforms it had to interact with. What kinds of problems would make it unacceptable to its market. You can't learn those things from the code. The idea of behavioral testing is popular among computer science academics, professors. Now, if your emphasis is on teaching students how to program, user needs and platform issues don't matter. The requirements for the program, they're whatever you tell the students. Realism doesn't matter. The exercise is academic. In that environment, black box testing might not make much sense. But when teachers of those courses describe black box testing as ignorance-based, because their students aren't burying their noses in their code. Well, I don't think they understand what they're writing about. Just like glass box testing is the counterpoint to black box, structural testing is the counterpoint to behavioral. Another set of distinctions that people make is between levels of testing. The lowest level is unit testing. I think of the most common meaning of unit testing among working professionals is testing in small parts of a program, individual functions or methods. Over the last decade, we've seen the emergence of a new generation of unit test tools and widespread adoption of this technology among programmers. The concept of unit testing, however, is not necessarily tied to glass box testing of individual methods. For example, IEEE's standard on software unit testing presents a much more general definition. Basically, if you think of something as an integrated unit, it's a unit. One of the black box test techniques involves running tests that focus on the individual feature. This is called function testing. Its goal is to see how well the feature itself works without worrying about its interaction with other features. This is an example of black box unit testing. Integration testing involves testing several components together. At the lowest level, we might use unit test tools like JUnit to pass data from one method to another method and see how the units work together. At some point, as we test more parts of the program together, we start calling it high-level integration testing. Testing of the full running system is just another example of high-level integration testing. System testing is a confusing term because it doesn't really fit on the continuum from unit tests to integration tests. The confusion is that at the highest level of integration testing, you're really testing the entire system. But system testing is not just another name for high-level integration testing of the entire system. When we run a system test, we're trying to assess the value of the system not whether the pieces work together. That's integration testing. Rather than contrast system testing with unit testing, I prefer to contrast system testing with implementation level testing. System testing is about how valuable the program is. Implementation level testing is about how well the program is written. The extreme programming community prefers to use the word programmer testing for what I'm calling implementation level testing. I don't object to the term programmer testing, but it's confusing. Too many of my students think this means any testing by any programmer. And that's too broad to be useful. So I prefer to say implementation level instead. Another contrast that people draw frequently is between functional testing and parafunctional or non-functional testing. Now functional testing is black box testing, but it's specifically about treating the program like a function. A function transforms input data into outputs. A functional test case specifies inputs that will present to the program along with one or more expected outputs. From the definition of functional testing, we have an idea of what we're trying to do. In contrast, parafunctional testing, which some people prefer to call non-functional testing, deals with anything that is not functional testing. I don't find this contrast useful. The class of parafunctional tests is huge. It's too diverse. Testing a program for maintainability is fundamentally different from testing it for usability or for program scalability. We have to do those kinds of tests, but lumping them together under one clumsy sounding word, that doesn't help anyone think about the many different types of tasks or the need to budget time separately for each type. Instead, it makes a lot of different things sound the same. And that encourages managers to underestimate the challenge of dealing with this diversity of work.